Um, so I'll just read that now. The Berkeley Forum acknowledges that BC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Ali McCann. And as members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand on, but also we recognize that the Mwekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. Um, for more information, feel free to check in with the Native American State Development Office and the Mwekma Ohlone tribe. Um, and this is a living document. And with that, I'll bring up tonight's event manager, Brian Kim, to introduce Ms. Steinberg. It's my immense honor to introduce Layla Steinberg. It is my immense honor to introduce Ms. Layla Steinberg to the Berkeley Forum. Layla Steinberg is an American music manager who has most notably been the manager for legendary hip hop artists such as Tupac, Shakur, and Earl Sweatshirt. Her managerial and, me and mentorship role began in 1989 when Tupac Shakur attended one of her poetry classes in Oakland. Her passion for the literary arts continues to this day as she has founded Aim for the Heart, a nonprofit organization dedicated to developing emotional literacy for at risk incarcerated youth and men through poetry, spoken word, and music. In 2014, Steinberg co-taught a class at USC called Stereotypes, Prejudice, and the Rule of the Law, in which she brought together law students from USC, as well as San Quentin State Prison inmates to discuss the prison industrial complex, as well as mass incarceration of people of color. With that introduction, I would like to pass, I would like to move forward to Layla Steinberg's open address. Thank you, Ryan. Can you hear me okay? Well, thank you all for having me. I always wonder why anyone would show up, and I get nervous every time. But I, um, I couldn't say no. I always say my favorite word, or at least one of them, is consistency. And Brian kept calling. I think he found me on every platform. And he wouldn't leave me alone. So, <laughs> so I couldn't say no. And I don't know how to pack 60 years into 20 minutes, but I'm going to do my best. First thing I want to know is how many of you are here because you have an interest in music or the arts? OK, lots of you. Um, how about law? Okay, the social sciences and education. All right, and that covers a lot of my commitment and why I'm here. I, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me and how I came to this journey. I never planned to be where I am now and I'm so thankful, I'm very blessed. Um, I'm from Los Angeles. I was born in 1961 in LA, and I'm the child of immigrants. I am um, the daughter of a mother who came here as a child from Mexico. I think it's the first time I've had my mom come and, and participate. <laughs> She's an incredible woman who actually moved to the Bay when I was young. So I straddle LA and the Bay my whole life. I, um, I love the Bay, so an extra thank you for having me in the Bay. I can't say no to the Bay. And that's an important part of my education and why I'm here today, so I'll get to that. But I was born in Los Angeles to young parents. My mom helped put my dad through law school, and they had me. And as a child of the 60s, we, um, we think about the 60s and we have to think about activism and the waking up of a generation and the way music fueled the time I was born into. And the activism that came from the Panthers and that came from the women's movement. And so I was born into this um, convergence of activism and parents who had me too young. 
And what happens when you have children too young? I'm a product of that. And so I was identity challenged from the, the first time I have memory of like who I was as a kid. I went to a predominantly black school in Los Angeles. Um, I have a family of Sephardic and Ashkenazic Jews. I didn't know if I was Mexican, white, Turkish. From what I've traced, everyone in my family was born in a different place. <laughs> and so I didn't know who I was or where I belonged. But what I know is in elementary school, the one place I was embraced and I felt at home was in music and in the arts. And I felt connection to the community. And I remember in fifth grade that I had an awareness of the Vietnam War and what was going on. And I just remember listening. Marvin Gaye didn't write what's going on, but he delivered it with such passion that it affected me. I, I just remember being 10 or 11 years old and hearing Marvin Gaye and asking the question. And I don't know if every child asks why they're here at a young age or what they're meant to do in their life. But for me, I did. I remember being so young and just questioning my family and where I belonged and who I was and the people around me that I loved and the struggle that I saw. And I wanted to do something with my life. And I wanted people to stop hurting and my parents to stop hurting. And so I was driven at such a young age to question. And then my dad, who was a juvenile offender in Los Angeles, who also grew up in the neighborhood I was born into, because of his privilege and because of his parents, had a different outcome than the circle he grew up in. And so my dad went from a juvenile offender to a public defender. And so as a child, in the summers, I would go to the criminal courts with my father. And my dad would have me sit in the back of the court. I was supposed to do homework or draw or do something. I don't know why I was in court with my father instead of with babysitters, but I was. And I would see one kid after another after another go through the public defender's office, and they were always black or brown. And I remember asking my dad if white kids got in trouble. And he said, white kids usually have private attorneys. And black and brown children are subject to public defenders. And I was young. I didn't understand that, but I wanted to understand it. And then my dad brought his work home with him. So it was always one case after another case. And I began to have an obsession with crime, my neighborhood, and the conversation in the back of my head that once we made enough money, we would leave the neighborhood. And why were we going to leave the neighborhood I grew up in and the friends I bonded with and I loved? And so by middle school, my father went into private practice, and we began to migrate west. And so I went from South Central to Santa Monica to the beach in Malibu. Mm -hmm. So I straddled poverty and privilege, access, um, and I brought my community and my neighborhood and my childhood friends with me. I um, maintained my friendships, and I remember in eighth grade in Santa Monica, the principal called my parents. I don't know if my mom even remembers this, but they wanted to know why my brother and I talked the way we did, because we were suddenly in white, privileged, north side Santa Monica. And I came from a really different reality than the kids that I was suddenly in school with. And that provoked more questions and more challenges, and I didn't understand my privilege, I didn't understand our mobility, but I ached for a community that I saw and grew up with that didn't have the same access. And by high school, I began to understand race differently. I began 
began to understand what my father talked about. I began to understand that my mother's experience and her family's experience was different than mine. My mom had a brown, Middle Eastern, and, and Hispanic family. Um, and I looked like my dad. And just looking like I looked, I had a really different experience. And I wanted to deconstruct that. I wanted to understand that. And I wanted to be part of changing that narrative. I then did my first two years of college in Panama. My mom's sister moved to Panama um, when I was young. And actually, another big influence on my life was that my grandfather won the lottery in Mexico, actually. Who wins the lottery? <laughs> but my grandfather won the lottery in Mexico and gave the money, most of it, to his children, which I think is why we were able also to move to the west side. I think my mom was able to help us get a house. And my mom's sister and her husband wanted to travel Europe. My uncle took a sabbatical, and they brought me with them. So I was 13 or 14 when I went to Europe. And it was a trip that we went to every museum, every library, every church, temple, mosque. Anywhere we could go and learn, my uncle and aunt wanted to take us. And because he won the lottery, they paid for me and I got to travel with my family. And so um, that was when I was younger. I, then I, um, my aunt, when I visited them in Panama, there was this incredible area in Panama that I said, if I ever had an opportunity to live in this area, it's called Amazos. And this is before the Panamanians got the canal back. I would do anything to live there. And so right after high school, she called and said, guess what? That area that you said you would love to live, we just moved there. Why don't you come and go to college in Panama? So I thought it would be a really uh, amazing opportunity for me to step outside of this country and broaden my view while I was figuring out what I was going to do in my life. So I moved to Panama, did my first two years of college there, and then came back and went to college in Northern California so I could be close to my mother. And in this time, when I was in Panama was actually the time that the Panamanians were fighting for control of the canal. So then I began to learn about colonization and control of territory in a way that I didn't understand before. Because watching the Panamanians fight for their, their land, and I happened to live in an area that was the most beautiful place in Panama. And it was all Americans living in an area that should have um, been there for Panamanians. And I began to question my family that was there and why I was even living on the beach in an area that was so beautiful. So that expanded my view a little more and had me thinking a little bit more about what I was doing and who I was in this life and what was I going to do. And I kept thinking about what is wrong with us. All of us on some level, unless you're so rare, um, have some trauma. We're, we all have some issues, and we all have some level of broken. So if we could make the world better or change the world, what did I see? What was my witness in, in solving these problems? Um, definitely race was at the top of the list, looking at all over the world how um, race affects us, the role of race. Um, financial literacy was an issue, how we learn about finance, economics. But over and over again, it didn't matter whether I met people from poverty or privilege. I saw broken hearts everywhere. Like We are a broken people. It didn't matter where I traveled or where I went. I saw broken people, and I saw broken families. And I was challenged to understand how we think in the West and how we think in other parts of the world. Um, was I liberal? 
was I conservative? I have very conservative family, and I have some very liberal parents. And I struggled with that, too. I didn't really, um, I wouldn't raise my children the way I was raised. And I'm thankful for um, all the lessons and everything I got, but, um, you know, I was raised by hippies. <laughs> and in the 60s, and we were experimenting um, with way too much. And I don't know that that was healthy, but I was strong. And many of my friends raised like I was weren't. You know, I have a lot of friends. I had friends that ended up with the Moonies and others that were with Rajneesh and ended up in communists because their parents took them. I knew, I personally knew people that died in Guyana. Um, so I, I was really affected by being raised in that time period. And so fast forward, um, what I also was going to say that um, growing up in LA, my refuge was Inner City Cultural Center. It was off of Vermont and Pico. And when we moved to the west side, I would take the bus to do classes every chance I got. And Bill Summers and all these incredible artists were inner city. And also, you know, I was pretty much the pale young person mm -hmm. that wanted to be in everything from the African dance company to the salsa groups. And they would let me in. And now I look at pictures of myself. I was so awkward. And I think <laughs> that, you know, in Zinga Kamara, this incredible woman, she brought African dance to LA. And I wanted to be in the company so bad, and I'm saying, Zinga, please. And so slowly, she let me participate. Next thing I know, I was in the company. And I actually was all right. I wasn't the best, but I was good enough. And you see you know, the videos and the photos, and they're coming out soon in this series. It's going to be really embarrassing. <laughs> but she let me participate, and I began to learn about African culture and the gift that came from Africa that I didn't have in my family and my community. And as I began to learn, I was included in more and more um, performances and more and more artists. And so by the time I moved to Northern California, I, um, I went to school here and then I went back to LA. I was supposed to be in sports therapy or sports medicine. I worked with LA Track Club in 1984. I um, had three athletes I worked with that were actually in the Olympics. And I was on this track. I always wanted to please my father. And he wanted a doctor or a lawyer or at least um, not an artist. <laughs> and my heart was in the arts. I somehow believed the power of arts to change humanity was where I was supposed to be, but that wasn't necessarily acceptable. Um, and then I ended up with um, a boyfriend in 1984 and ended up pregnant and had kids. So that, that was the beginning of my having children. And then I didn't want to raise my kids in LA. I'm condensing and moving fast because I want to get points of view. But I moved um, back to the Bay as a young mother. And I was going to be in physical therapy and I would sneak off. It was like my secret world to go be in a band or, or go do something in the arts. But it wasn't what I was going to do because I did come from a family that didn't necessarily accept the arts as something vital and relevant. And my mother's an artist, but she left the family. So I didn't want to be ostracized in the same way. I, I really wanted approval. And so I ended up as a young mother in the Bay Area and I ended up in a band. Um, at first it was a, a predominantly Latin band in Sonoma County. And then I started a dance company and this was all not serious. It was my little sneak off thing to do. And I say that because I didn't know anybody that did business and music. And it was just a joke. And one day, our dance company was doing a, a show at the Pitati Cabaret. And we opened for OJ Egomode, the Nigerian All-Stars, who was a very well-known Nigerian artist that came out of the Bay. And he had come with a number of South African artists. 
and he's known as the father of world beat music. And his mission at the time was that Nigerian and South African artists were touring the, the U.S. to educate people in the U.S. about the apartheid movement and ending apartheid. And he saw the company I was in and he said, you know, would you be interested in auditioning to be in my band? And I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> um, yeah, but I didn't really think I'd get in and I couldn't imagine it. And there were definitely no participants that looked <laughs> like me. But I did. I went to a rehearsal and the next thing I know, I was in this band. And they were seriously touring. He was getting ready to go out with Santana. And I didn't know how I was going to tell my husband, and you know, I had young children, that I was going to join the band and pursue what I absolutely loved and not be at the physical therapy office. And it was still a joke to me, but I did it. And at the same time, I started promoting shows in Northern California um, because in my heart, I'm an educator. I'm not even in the entertainment business. People always think I'm in entertainment. I don't think there's anything wrong with entertainment, but I never was interested in entertaining. I was interested in impact and making change and making a difference. And so what I also realized is I wasn't the most talented in the band. I was singing and dancing, but the reason that I was in the band was because it was so difficult at that time for an all-black band to travel through the South, through the East, through the Midwest, and it was also difficult for a Nigerian artist mm -hmm. to speak to people who look like me about apartheid and about standing up. And so I began to get educated by this incredible group of African artists about my responsibility and utilizing my privilege to make change. And so I got this incredible education from this man. If you don't know who O.J. Akamode is, look him up. He's in his 80s now. He's still performing. I don't know how, because at 60, I'm like, he always says, can you do one more run with us? And I'm like, I am too old, are you kidding? But there is no age in the voice, and there is no age in the spirit, and he is still out making a difference. So I say that to say, I was married to a man who loved music, and he was an amazing DJ in LA. And it was the beginning of hip hop. And just like I was in this band so that I could utilize my whiteness, my privilege, my voice, and speak to people who look like me, I also was an asset to Bruce, who would go and sign and rent facilities to do shows and bring rappers that he grew up with, and it was the beginning back then. And he'd go and he'd try to rent a place, and they'd say, oh, we're booked. Two days later, I'd go back in, hi, I'm Layla Steinberg, I want to throw an event, do a benefit. Um, can I get this date? And they'd say, oh, no problem. And I'd say, wow, two days ago, <laughs> Bruce went in and couldn't get the facility. So it took me to another level of understanding just how racist this country is and how difficult it is to be black and to access what somebody like me could walk in and get in an instant. And so I began to front for his whole circle. I never planned on being in hip hop or rap music. I really understood the eruption of pain and that this art form was um, a very important conversation. I got that, but I definitely didn't think I should be in front of it, and I didn't see myself um, as a voice in hip hop at all. I definitely was critical of white rappers. I definitely saw in the music industry that um, that if you were white, you could be half as talented and access things that black people who put in so much work couldn't. So in my own bias and resentment for what I had seen, I also struggled with what my role would be and what I could contribute. But I did begin to support artists that were in hip hop. Um, but I had to 
this dream about challenging what i understood as education that wasn't inclusive and i my husband was black so i had mixed kids that also would have some of my challenges they would know that they were black which also meant that they had to find a way to understand where they came from because if you're in this country and born in this country and you're black you are usually a product of slavery um where do we come from what's our story and then um the native american connection and then there's me so i wanted to have children that understood who they were and didn't feel so challenged and out of place as i did so how was i going to do that and i began to create ways of doing programs in the schools and so i started an organization um i work for other people's organizations first but i began to do multicultural programs and assemblies in the schools and i also worked in high school my uncle um, was a big campaign manager handled a lot of republican campaigns and i learned a lot about how he managed campaigns and how telemarketing can direct an entire campaign. If you get on the phone and you telemarket, you can change people's whole ideas of who they're voting for by asking the right questions. So I decided I was going to take what I learned from what he did. Oftentimes I didn't agree with it, but I was going to apply it to rap artists who I knew that needed a campaign manager. And that was kind of my entry helping my husband. All of a sudden, I was in hip hop. I don't know how it happened. I didn't plan it. Didn't even want to be there. But I love some people who needed me to utilize my access and my voice. How am I doing on time, Ryan? <laughs> um. I really came because you guys matter so much to me, and that um, that you're the next generation of brilliant minds. So anytime there's students I can be available to and teach you everything I've learned, I want to. So I want to make sure there's a lot of time for questions. And so how much more time do I have? Five, five minutes. more minutes? Because I <laughs> told you 60 years and 20 minutes is really hard for me. Um, and I'm excited we have some guests. I didn't even know we're showing up. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, So 1988-89, I suddenly was doing programs in all these schools. I was promoting shows. It was still an accident. I didn't know anyone who did it. I didn't really even think I was doing it, but I was like, people were saying, oh, she's a promoter. She's a producer. She's in bands. And that was my little secret life. I'd go back to LA, wouldn't tell my family anything I was doing. It was, you know, I get on planes, I do shows and tour Thursday to Sunday. Then I started sneaking my kids onto the tour. Um, and next thing, they were on stages with me. And then I did a show at the Santa Rosa Fairgrounds that 10,000 kids showed up to. It was a benefit for my nonprofit so I could do the work in the schools. It wasn't for entertainment. It was all about creating ways to educate outside of the box to do assemblies where we could talk about race, social justice, the prison industry, life skills, emotional literacy, because they weren't doing that in classrooms. And all these kids showed up. And they thought I was like a big shot from LA, and I thought it was so funny. People were coming up to me like I was really doing something. And I just kept thinking I was tricking people the whole way. Like, how is this happening? And we made really good money at that show. And a man named Atrium Gregory came up to me. And he said, you really have something going on in this secondary market. I didn't even know what a secondary market was. And he said, he was from the Bay. He had moved down to LA. And he was working with Jerry Heller. And he was working with Eazy-E and NWA and JJ Fad. And I was actually bringing their artists up when they'd come into San Francisco or Oakland I'd bring them into Santa Rosa and do these little side shows for half the money. And it just started catching on. And he said, if you ever come across an artist that you think is that good, I'll help you. Mm. And he said that, and I was like, I'm going to hold you up 
on that. I don't know why, but you know, I'm gonna remember that. And then I had done this tour with OJ, and there were all these rap artists that I knew needed promotions and marketing. We didn't have phones, we didn't have internet. And I was doing a tour through the South, and I brought everyone's flyers, you know, little flyers, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And I had all the Nigerians in the um, tour bus going with me. Every time we went to a college, I'd say, come on, I'd give everyone a little money, and we would go to every dorm and slide flyers <laughs> under the door. And I turned our band into an entire promotion vehicle for these young artists. And it worked. And it started making a difference. And then I, I felt like a hypocrite because I was doing these school assemblies and I was bringing artists who had material that wasn't too clean. And I'd have them do a clean song, do the assembly with me. And at the time, things weren't too accessible. So I knew parents might not find out that when they go back and they hear Spice One's whole tape or Two Shorts or whoever's, um, I would have gotten in trouble. So I kept saying, I need an artist that speaks to social political issues, that kind of understands where I came from, and that I could put in assemblies that wouldn't get me in trouble. And I, I wanted to talk about the Bay really fast. There is nowhere like the Bay Area when it comes to artists and activism. Um, there's nowhere like the Bay for starting movements. The Black Panthers started in the Bay Area for a reason. And I always knew all of the activism that came out of the Bay because the Bay was my teacher. And so, um, a young woman named Lawanda was in my group. I had a whole group of young artists I work with that did these assemblies with me. And Lawanda said, there's a kid that just moved from Baltimore. He could be your high school speaker. He is really amazing, and he's like you. I was like, you don't know what I'm looking for, and I would not listen to her. And three months straight, she kept saying, this kid Tupac, he's the one. And I ended up meeting Pac and I connected with him in that way. His music was not for entertainment, it was really for him to get his message out. That changed, and if I had hours, I would talk about the way that it changed, the mistakes we made, the accountability that I need to have, which is why I show up anytime I can, because we did get derailed. Um, before I get into questions, when I was trying to figure out why I was coming here and what I was going to really talk about, my mom ended up playing um, an interview for me by a man named Carl Palmet. Has anyone ever heard of Carl Palmet? Okay, well, I, I just want to read a paragraph from Carl, who um, he, wa he gave the freshman address at Boston Conservatory. And like Paul, who was an incredible artist, but knew that his parents would not accept him in the field of arts, he, um, he gave this incredible address that's worth all of you listening to. But um, when I listened to him, I understood that this is why I'm in the arts, and why any of you that are passionate and have an interest in the arts should listen to his address. The first people to understand how music really worked were ancient Greeks. This will fascinate you. The Greeks said that music and astronomy were two sides of the same coin. Astronomy was seen as the study of relationships between observable, permanent, external objects, and music was seen as the study of relationships between invisible, internal, hidden objects. Music has a way of finding the big, invisible, moving pieces inside our hearts and souls and helping us figure out the position of things inside of us. Then he goes on to give incredible examples. And then, I gotta finish reading this other paragraph because I think it's so important. If 
we were a medical school and you were here as med students practicing appendectomies, you'd take your work very seriously because you would imagine that some night at 2 a.m. someone is going to waltz into your emergency room and you're going to have to save their life. Well, my friends, someday at 8 p.m. someone's going to walk into your concert hall and bring you a mind that's confused, a heart that's overwhelmed, and a soul that's weary. Whether they go out whole again will depend partly on how well you do your craft. We're not here to become an entertainer, and you don't have to sell yourself. The truth is you don't have anything to sell. Being a musician, an artist, isn't about dispensing a product like selling you Chevys. I'm not an entertainer. I'm a lot closer to a paramedic, a firefighter, a rescue worker. You're here to become a sort of therapist for the human soul a spiritual version of a chiropractor, physical therapist, someone who works with our insides to see if they get things to line up, to see if we can come into harmony with ourselves and be healthy and happy as well. So I wanted to read that to say that what drew me to working in arts and with artists is that every one of us has a soundtrack to our lives. If every one of us in the room sat down and wrote the soundtrack of our life, we would have the song that has us burst into tears, the song we play to heal our trauma, the song we make love to, the music that changes us. And that's what changed me. It was music that made me want to serve and make a difference to humanity. It was artists that turned on the light bulb in my brain. It was African artists that took me on the road when I really wasn't talented or good enough to be alongside of the greats and helped me understand that their traveling city to city is what helped to end apartheid. And when I was in South Africa with South African artists, I saw the result of all this work. It was Jack Keeley working with Tracy Chapman and Sting that um, did work with Amnesty International that helped so many people. So I really, um, I dispute anybody that says I'm here and I'm in entertainment. I'm here because I have impact with artists who can impact the world. And anytime there's an artist that I can offer something to to help them, then um, I'm gonna keep showing up because one artist can reach so many and our school system is so flawed that we need to amplify voices who understand their responsibility. I didn't really talk about Tupac or Earl at all, and there are so many more artists that I've worked with and still work with. Uh, I still do mic sessions for 30-something years. I still have the nonprofit, and my focus is emotional literacy in that work. But I want to open it up, and I can still keep talking you know, within people's questions. So. Did I run out of time? Yeah. We're good. Don't worry about it. <laughs>
of the messaging and a lot of what was going on wasn't always healthy. And so, interestingly enough, I, I think that um, that I have at least three visitors that surprised me who that I worked with in San Quentin. Um, Cuddy, is that you in the back? No? I see Erlon, right? Um, I, I, um, I remember when I was in San Quentin in the early days, I went in in 1990 to do an assembly in San Quentin, and Lonnie Morris um, was incarcerated. He just got out after 43 years. He really challenged me because I work with a lot of artists that he felt spread violence and gang culture. And I always had an excuse and a reason and I justified who I work with and I didn't always challenge the young people I work with. And there was violence everywhere. I can't even tell you, it made no sense that I've been in as many shootouts as I have. Like I've been in some shit in, in my years. And it didn't have to be that way. And so I say that we've changed because we've grown a lot and we understand the implications of our actions and we understand that things land and, and there are consequences. So as I've aged and grown, so has the industry. And you know, Too Short and Tupac and a lot of the early artists I work with are a world away from Earl Sweatshirt. And I, I can talk more about that also. But um, I was responsible for a lot of toxic material. I was responsible because I helped get access and I promoted things that now I have to sit back and say, you know, um, how many, were as many people helped as there were hurt? And why didn't I stand up? And I was young then, I was in my 20s and I had no idea the things I know now. And so I'm much more vocal now. I'm, you know, I've got grandkids in high school now, so it's different. Um, and I see things differently. But I am responsible and accountable. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I answered that very well. <laughs> interview with NPR, you mentioned that Tupac made you recognize these privileges of your background and motivated you to become a business woman. You've impacted with a lot of young people through your work in performing part, which is a nonprofit you founded, as well as your work in the criminal justice system. What influence, if any, have you had on you? I, I said that about Pac. Um, because when Pac came into my life and into my home, I have three children I gave birth to and then raised stepchildren that were not biologically mine and they were black and called me mom because I was their mother. And so Tupac had a really hard time when he first met my children and I raised Kwani from the time she was three months old. And I was the only mother she knew for years until I took her to meet her biological mother. And so for him, growing up as a panther, growing up um, with the mother he grew up with, he was kind of appalled when he came in and he was like, what? I can't not speak about race and because of who I am, I, I feel like I have a responsibility to speak up to someone as white as you, raising black children, I feel like they're my children. And I was like, who are you? Like, who are you talking about? But he did challenge me in a way, especially because he was younger and because he came from a Panther household. And I had a mom who was an activist, but her activism was different. And I knew a lot about Cesar Chavez and the farm workers and, and other fights, but I didn't understand the fight of the Panthers in the same way, even though my dad worked in the system and worked as a public defender, it was different. And I, with working with Pac, began to understand a level of responsibility. I mean, we are warehousing black and brown children. Like, if you have not ever stepped into a, a prison or a juvenile facility, 
you have a responsibility to understand what's going on. And that, it definitely influenced me having him in my life. And it helped me to understand my work in education differently. And so I appreciated him for that. And I was an educator before Pops. I had this commitment before him. But he definitely played a role in my commitment and in my understanding the responsibility I had as a parent raising mixed and black children. And going into your work in criminal justice, your work with No More Tears and Aim for the Heart reflects a passion for restorative justice, which aims to remedy some of these harms associated with crime from the bottom up. Given your knowledge of these structural causes for over-criminalization, what about all the top-down political approaches compared to bottom-up remedial ones at preventing the harms of over-criminalization? That was so long that I don't even know if I knew what the question was. But, I mean, I spent almost 30 years. I was talking about my experience with Lonnie a little while ago and going into San Quentin and the impact. And my arguments with him because I didn't agree and I justified my work. But I learned so much in my time working with incarcerated men. When he read my intro and talked about the class of my involvement at USC, I didn't teach the class on race, stereotypes, and the rule of law. It's Professor Armour and his class at USC. But I began to co-facilitate and speak with him. And I really understood the value in going in and working with law students because what happens is a lot of people that end up representing people come from privilege. And they have no idea who they're serving. They don't understand the demographic. They don't understand the pain. They don't understand its history. So it's so important to begin to build bridges and conversations between those who serve and those who are affected by. And so even though I have no idea what your question was, this is such an important part for me and my work. And I'm fascinated by law. I saw the most disturbing series. If you haven't watched Your Honor, it's actually horrible. But it had set – I'm the daughter of a – my dad became a judge before he passed away. So I'm the child of a judge. What a responsibility to be a judge and to be objective. And I ended up watching that show, and I bring it up because what was so painful and disturbing about it is how damn real that was and how faulty our educational and our justice system has been. And that's why, like all these brilliant minds, you guys are at Cal, so many of you. And you are the change. Like your studies will make such a difference. All it takes is one. So, again, I don't know if I answered your question. But did I? Thank you for your thoughtful response. And briefly, before we move on to the audience, I'll ask one last question. Recently, Pulitzer presented the alchemist to the guy he and his little sweatshirt collaborated on an album that they did on YouTube under a pseudonym. Do you have any tips for doing that? Well, we just did a show last week in L.A. at the Novo. It was sold out. It was awesome. We're really close. I love Al. And, yeah, I can't really tell you who's my friend, but there's some really good stuff coming. And if I told you I learned anything from Pops, what I learned from Earl is next level. I don't know if I have time to really tell you, but Earl I've learned so much from. And he's, you know, his journey is different. Tupac was the son of the Panther movement, not just the son of a Feeney and Billy Garland. He was the son of a movement. But Earl's father was one of the founding members of the African National Congress. His mother is one of the most important law professors in the country. So he was born also with a huge responsibility. 
but I don't think I I learned that with Tupac he really believed I could be in business and push me to manage him I never thought I had any skills in business I hate business by the way but um, but as far as with Puck, I learned that I could be in business, and he encouraged me because of selfish reasons. He needed a manager, he needed someone that could navigate and get in, and so he pushed me, and it was self-serving. And I appreciated it because I learned I could do it. With Earl, I learned about self-worth. I learned some things I never imagined. How am I gonna learn from this 16, 17-year-old kid? And I ended up, I'll tell you really fast, this quick story, because it's so funny. I might not tell it publicly to give, but actually I'm on camera, so you're going to hear me. Um, <laughs> was that the last question yeah. before I jump into this? So, um, do we have Earl fans in here? No. Okay, I've got to tell you this really fast. So, I do this workshop all over. So, I'm at the Boys and Girls Club in Santa Monica, and my son is like, oh my God, that kid right there, his name is Earl. He was 13 at the time. He's like, he's so good. Invite him to your workshop. I'm like, yeah, okay. So I go up, and I'm like, I heard you're really talented. And he looked at me and rolled his eyes all like, who is she? <laughs> so I'm thinking, you know, I've done a few things. If he's that good, he's going to want to come to my workshop. And I'm like, you know, I do this workshop. And, you know, poets, rappers, actors, singers, you should come check it out. And he, if he could have spit on me, like, that's how I felt. He rolled his eyes at me so mean and brushed me off and walked away. But, you know, God works in mysterious ways. He was so mean. And I was like, I'm never talking to that kid again with his root. And so then, fast forward, he's 15. He does this, that video that's horrible, went viral. Sorry, Kevin, if you hear this. Um, but it went viral, and it's the video where they took every drug known to mankind and put it in the blender, and it's a day, you know, and he has this trip. And I'm like, oh, my God, I saw it. It came out. I'm like, that's that kid? And I hated the video. All my kids are watching it. Everyone's watching it. I'm like, oh, this is horrible. So fast forward again. Now I'm at USC in the law department. I'm working. I'm really, like, law. I, I should have been a lawyer. So... Mm -hmm. I love Cheryl Harris's work. We talk about her at USC in the department. I know all about her now. And I also love Willie's work because South Africa, South Africans and Nigerians educated me. And all of a sudden, I get a call from the man, Larry Bresnan, who's a friend of my big producer. He was Robin Williams' manager. He used to bring Robin Williams to my workshop. And he says, man, I've got this challenging situation. There's this woman, her name's Cheryl Harris. Can you come to my office and have a meeting? I'm like, Cheryl Harris, the lawyer? So I go to Beverly Hills to his office, and there's Cheryl. And they tell me this story about this kid, this rapper. You know, and I work with kids who get in trouble really well. I could, you know, but for the grace of God and my pale skin, that could have been me. And so I understand people who think outside the box and don't like rules and get in trouble. So I end up in this meeting and she says, my son, you know, he's got in trouble at school. There's a zero tolerance policy at the school and the only way that he could get back into this private school that she worked so hard to have him go to is if she sent him away to a camp for, you know, behavioral modification. But he has a song that's popping, it's going viral and she sends him to this camp so he could get back in school for this thing I won't tell you that he did that got him in trouble. Mm -hmm. So he's in the camp for two weeks, and he's trying to run away so he can come home and get emancipated and be a rap star. And his mom wants him to graduate high school, which she should, and she's not having it. So he is not going to stay in this camp. He's doing everything he can. He's trying to contact Tyler and everybody else. So then... <laughs> The guy at the school says, hey, you know, there's this program in Western Samoa that Jerry Rice and his brother and some other people help fund. You remove people from, you, you got to get away from people, places, and things, and that's how you change. Maybe you should send him to Samoa. She wants to save her son. His behavior's not cool. That video was not cool. And now, after the things I told you I learned along the way, I'm like, that's not cool. If my son did that, I'd take his ass and send him across, you know, do something also. <laughs> so she decides she's going to send him away so he at least gets it together and graduates high school. 
Can you imagine being plucked out of your reality? Your videos now get 15 million views. And no one knows where you are. You get sent halfway across the world, or all the way across the world, to Western Samoa. No phones, no contact, no nothing. No one knows where he is. There's a free Earl sweatshirt campaign going on. <laughs> Everyone's wearing t-shirts. Every kid I know in Santa Monica knows who he is, and I'm sworn to secrecy. And his mom and Larry say, Layla, do you think you can help him cooperate? Because now he's in Samoa, and he's not even cooperated. And I'm like, oh my god, I know your son. He's extra mean to me. I don't think he likes me. And so she says, can we make a meeting and do a... Um, a Skype. So I end up talking to him. I can't tell anybody I know where he is. Everyone wants to know where Earl is. Free Earl sweatshirt. Even little Ray Wayne is rocking a free Earl. <laughs> and I get on my phone and I'm like, hey, Kevin, do you remember me? And he's like, no, should I? And I said, yeah, you should. He said, I know he's one. My mom told me. We've got the Tupac poetry book here and the Michael Dyson book. I know all about you. And I was like, yeah, I was at the Boys and Girls Club. I tried to get you to come to my workshop. And he's like, no. So anyway, I'm telling you that to say it was a really funny moment, and that's God. And here I was talking to the kid that wanted nothing to do with me, and I said, I could get you out of there. If you cooperate, I will fly across the world and come and get you. And here's my condition. So anyway, fast forward, I went to go get him. Been with him ever since. Can't shake him. But what happened was, we came back, and I said, if you graduate high school, I will help you organize your career. Even though I quit this horrible, toxic business, I hate this industry. I love what art does to the heart and to people, but I hate this industry. But I'll at least help you navigate it and get organized. So I just want to tell you just one thing so you understand my lesson from Earl. He's back six months, and he gets an offer to do a show. He's never done a real show, and they want to give him $25,000 to fly to do this one show in the UK. And I'm like, wow, you've never done anything? 15 minutes, 25000 that's a big deal. I don't want to do it. And I'm like, you've never done a show yet. That's a lot of money. And I go back and forth with him. I go to the promoter. I'm like, you don't want to do it. Get him to do it. What, what's it going to take? And I go back to him, and I'm back and forth with him. And I'm like, I don't think I'm going to be able to work with him. And finally, I'm like, what will it take? And he's like, man, I need at least 100000 I need first class flight. Because <laughs> I don't want to do it. I didn't realize he was so scared and so nervous. He really didn't want to do it. And he said, I don't want to do it. You've got to give me something I can't say no to. So if I get first class flights and 100000 I can't say no to that, I'll do it. Now, I'm sharing his personal business for the lesson. I go back and I tell him, they're not going to do it. Are you crazy? What's wrong with you? So I give him this whole lecture, and I go back, and I say, he doesn't want to do it. The only way he will do it is for 100000 He probably doesn't even remember that. 100000 and first class flights were... Going to UK first class is really expensive. So anyway, I go and I tell them, and I go back to him. I'm like, I told them. And he said, good. So they call me two days later, and they say, no problem. We'll get another couple months. <laughs> <laughs> and he says to me, I want to work with you because I know I could leave my wallet on the table. And that you will never, like, I can trust you, but I know how to do this better than you do. And I know my worth. And I want to know that you know your worth. You'll represent me so much better. And it was such a lesson for me that since then, it's been nine years, he guides our team, and we support what he wants. He is an artist. He does not care about entertaining you, and he doesn't care about the money. He strictly works from the heart. And he's not ready to be at the top of the charts. He doesn't care about that. He's had so many opportunities. Kendrick Lamar said Earl's his favorite artist. <laughs> so I'm just saying that to say that people think it's crazy when I say I learned a lot more about self-worth from a 17-year-old. Earl was 17 when I learned that lesson. We are never too old to learn from anyone. Wisdom comes from the mouth of babes. And we always have 
have to stay open. And I'm not in the entertainment business. I'm in the business of education and of sparking young artists' minds to know their power and their impact. And one song could change the world. It's that simple. So, all right.
So you guys can email me. I told you I'd make myself accessible. So my name at Gmail, I'll answer any questions I didn't answer. Definitely. Thank you so much. Can we give it up one more time? <laughs> this now because she went to the gym in front of her. But at every event, we like to surprise our speaker with a personally made poster, and this event is no different. Oh, thank you, guys. <laughs> All the posters are made by our team, our team, and this poster was made by Flora Fawn. Um, I also like to run as like, a bunch of music rights, like, oh, so talented. Um, Monet, Kosh, Flora, and Diana We have an event coming on Monday where we have the founder of Boy Chick Bagels um, in Berkeley. Um, she'll come on Monday. We'll have actually Boy Chick Bagels at that event, so if you never had it, that's an awesome time to come out. Um, and it'll be in GCC B103. And thank you for coming. If you have any feedback, um, we thrive on feedback, so feel free to scan this QR code or uh, find us at pennyurl.com slash tbsfeedback. And if you'd like to help support us in any financial capacity, um, any amount helps us uh, events that are as amazing as this and to keep it free and accessible to the general public. So you can join us as well. Um, with that, I'd like to say have a great night and get home safely.